Okay, that's yours, right? Is the use of autotonous blood products in dental alveolar surgery. Uh, I termed this presentation as such because while I'm basically going to speak about platelet-rich plasma, platelet-rich fibrin, I understand there's a great debate surrounding the use of these products in really all aspects of healthcare. Uh, what is the proper terminology for these factors? How many platelets are enough platelets? How do you, how, what's the best way to fabricate them and so forth? Uh, so while what I'm presenting today uh, will be a nice synopsis of my experience with them, in, in no way, shape, form, or fashion am I saying it's the only way to do it, uh, or, but this definitely has been proven to be effective in what I've been able to provide for patients. Uh, quick question, uh, how many people here do surgery? Awesome, uh, implants as well? Okay, grafting, awesome. So I'm sure I'm gonna, a lot of what I'm gonna present here may very well be you know, known to everyone here, but uh, so we all know the problem. There are an awful lot of dentures on this planet and an awful lot of people who are no longer satisfied wearing these prosthetics. They've gone through two, three, four, five different sets uh, and they're, they're taught them, they want something different. They understand that we as practitioners can provide something for them that is vastly superior to what they've had in the past. They are better educated, they have higher expectations. Uh, they demand more of us as practitioners. Now, historically, there have been a number of ways that we as practitioners have attempted to maneuver within and around an atrophic alveolus. Um, many implants uh, a few years ago were the rage uh, and still definitely have a role in dental alveolar surgery. Um, inserting 2.4, 2.8 by 11, 13 millimeter fixtures and fabricating overdenture um, implant supported prosthetics. Great restoration. Obviously, you still have some limitations, but uh, are far, fun far more functional than your guard variety removable prosthetic. Zygomatic implants, those are, oh, sorry, that would be these jokers right here. Uh, this is primarily for uh, people with no alveolus, people with huge continuity defects, uh, status post cancer resections, for example. You're placing two rather large fixtures in the zygomatic arches bilaterally, and you're hanging a fixed prosthetic off of those implants. Ridge augmentations, wonderful procedures, especially ridge splits. We'll see an example of that uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, you're splitting the alveolus sort of like a book. Uh, and inserting implants into that open book, if you will. Onlay grafts, a uh, number of ways in which you can do this. J blocks, where you're taking a freeze dry, demineralized cortical cancellous block. Uh, you're also harvesting autogenous factors such as chin, ramus, and anterior posterior hips. In my residency, we did an awful lot of anterior posterior hip grafts. You get an abundance of bone, good quality bone, readily implantable bone but you can appreciate the morbidity that comes with harvesting a hip and good luck trying to sell the patients coming into a dental office, say, I'm your dentist and I want to cut open your hip to take off some bone. Good luck with that. <laughs> right. Now, in addition to autographs like your ramus, your chin, your tuberosity, we have your allografts, xenografts, and alloplasts. Uh, I personally am a big proponent of freeze-dried cortical cancellous demineralized allografts. That's just my personal preference. Um, I have a lot of experience with cancellous grafts. Uh, it feels like I'm working with, with sand and I don't have the confidence that we're going to provide for the patient that three-dimensional scaffold we need for predictable bony regeneration. Not knocking it, but just to get my personal experience. Xenografts, uh, great products as well. The main difference being when you compare allografts to xenografts, xenografts you're talking six to nine months, sometimes even 12 months of remodeling, whereas with allografts you're done in four to six. Uh, alloplast, I have a lot of experience with calcium carbonate as well as HA. My only question about these materials moving forward is, do they really, how predictably do they generate bone? And I only say that because primarily in my residency, when I would go back to access sites that had been grafted with HA primarily, I found in a lot of cases I was still, use, still looking at HA and that, you know, kind of led me to kind of question their, uh, at least their benefit in my hands. Um, they're great as fillers. You have someone who is definitely going to get a removable prosthetic. HA, calcium carbonate are wonderful because they don't go anywhere. They don't resort very much at all. But ultimately what we're looking for is something that is osseoconductive, something that will provide a three-dimensional scaffold or matrix to facilitate passive bone regeneration or repair. 
You were looking for something that's osteoinductive. We want to be able to recruit those neuroprogenitor cells. We want to recruit those growth factors to promote healthy bone growth. And then ultimately, in the case of implants, we want something that promotes a nice stable anchorage between an implant and bone. And believe it or not, uh, while we radiographically may look at an x-ray and think we have good integration, while we tap on it, we'll torque it, thinks every, think everything is great, histologically, you'll necessarily have the intimate contact that we aspire to obtain. But research has shown that the use of autogenous factors can help in the improvement of that intimate contact we like for long-term stability of implant retained supported prosthetics. What we know about platelets is platelets are your foreman. They're key in every aspect of uh, wound healing, everything from hemostasis all the way to maturation. They secrete a wide variety of, of factors, including platelet-derived growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, and various coagulation factors and cytokines, and obviously antigenic factors as well. And by harvesting these factors, we're looking to provide a super physiologic supply of these growth factors. We want to give the body as much help as it possibly can in the regeneration and the maintenance of bone moving forward. Now, historically, science has developed many ways to access and to harvest and to take maximum advantage of these platelets, and these are just some examples of that. RHPDGF, that's recombinant human platelet-derived growth factor, uh, has a strongest potential to recruit these regenerative cells. Unfortunately, it does require a carrier, much like BMP, bone morphogenic protein. Wonderful product. This is the stuff that apparently grows bone on cabinets. And I have had some nice experience using BMP, and it is as advertised. Uh, you take your BMP, you impregnate a collagenous sponge, and you can grow all kinds of bone. The downside is there really is no perfect carrier. And on top of that, these people swell. And the pain tends to parallel the swelling that we witness with the use of BMP. Now, we also have GEM21, which is nothing more than recombinant human PDGF with beta tricalcium phosphate. The benefit being you get improved matrix uh, function. And now with matrix derivative, I personally have never dealt with this. Has anyone utilized enamic? You have, sir. Awesome. I'd like to talk to you if we can, maybe afterwards, and just kind of exchange some ideas if we can. Uh, I've heard it's pretty good stuff in its own regard. I don't treat periodontal disease, periodontal disease but um, I've heard good things about it, and I'd like to maybe afterwards exchange some, uh, some thoughts about it, if you will. Now, my experience has been primarily around uh, or with using both platelet-rich plasma and platelet-rich fibrin. PRP is wonderful stuff, all right? In my residency, my director used it almost exclusively, used nothing but PRP and, and, and HA. That's what everybody got when he wasn't going to hips, of course. And while it has a very strong potential of regenerating, neuro, uh, recruiting neuroprogenerative cells and facilitating bone growth, the downside is a couple of things. One, it takes a long time to process. You're talking 20 to 30 minutes of overall centrifuge time. And on top of that, you're adding an anticoagulant to your mix. So in theory, you're adding something to PRP that will counteract the body's ability to utilize these platelets. Now you compare that to platelet-rich fibrin, which gives you this nice matrix that you see on the right side. The presence of that matrix, in my opinion, makes PRF vastly superior to PRP. Because while PRP is wonderful the first couple of days, it's gone after two days. Whereas with PRF, you have something that can remain behind for a period of two, three, sometimes even four weeks. And in doing so, give you much greater control over how you can regenerate and sometimes maintain bony regeneration or tissue repair. Quick review of, it, of wound healing. Stage one, you have your inflammatory phase, that being over the course of the first one to three days. Platelets release cytokines and growth factors, recruiting those macrophages and neutrophils. Basically, you're debriding, removing necrotic tissue, cleaning up margins. Key factors in this phase, PDGF and IG, IGF. Platelet-derived growth factor and insulin-like growth factor can be used together. PDGF is a strong mitogen. It is very adept at promoting cell division. It promotes angiogenesis, gives you nice blood vessel formation, and it aids in debridement. Again, you want to clean up necrotic tissue, freshen up your margins. IGF, insulin-like growth factor, produced in the liver typically. It is also pretty good mitogen and gives you improved matrix function. And as I stated before, 
growth factors have been shown to give you better contact between the implant and the bone. And Lynch and Stefani both demonstrated that in the research. And also Becker in 1992 found that when you combine PDGF and IGF-2 uh, allografts, you get a better quality of bone. Stage two is the proliferative phase where this provisional matrix is now being fabricated. The fibroblasts are starting to come in and kind of do their thing. You're getting early blood vessel formation and the key factor here is vascular endothelial growth factor. Now this is actually a family of growth factors, A being the, fine that we, that the uh, formation that we find in P, uh, PRF, B being the embryonic variant, variant, C being for lymphangiogenesis, and D being for lymphatic vasculature development surrounding lung bronchioles. Stage three is the remodeling phase. Now, we don't need cell division at this point. We're just waiting for everything to kind of settle and mature. So the key factor here is your transforming growth factor beta one, of which BMP is a member. This, unlike as the previous slides, is a weak mitogen, but it stimulates collagen one formation. And as Mohammed demonstrated, you can improve regeneration in class two frication defects, obviously for treating periodontal disease. Now, a couple of slides comparing PRP to some formulations of A and LPRF. And as you can see here, initially, PRF is lap, or PRP rather, is lap in the field. It's great for the first couple of days. But as you can see, as you move from post-op day one to three to 10, the PRP is basically non-existent, whereas your A and LPRF, because of that fiber and matrix, are still doing the job. Now, the process by which we fabricate PRF is with the low-speed centrifuge concept. Now, when this was initially utilized, you got something known as LPRF. Again, you can kind of see this alphabet soup issue that we have, L's, A's, and elemental P's, and, and so forth. Now, in that process, you are centrifuging for 12 minutes at 2,700 RPMs, giving you 708 grams of PRF. The problem or issue, if you want to call it that, is that when these membranes were assessed histologically, there was a collection of cells found at the bottom of the matrix. So in theory, you weren't getting a nice, predictable, prolonged release of factors, but rather uh, a very short duration of release, thereby impairing the ability of the PRF to predict, to guide tissue repair. So the protocol was tweaked a bit. It went from 12 minutes down to eight eight down to five, and in doing so, now we have a more broad, a generalized distribution of these factors within the matrix, giving you, better, again, a better quality of product there. IPRF, now you're centrifuging for only three minutes. This is, in my view, sort of like the liquid equivalent uh, or the PRP equivalent of, um, the liquid equivalent of <laughs> the PRP of PRF, if you will, uh, in which you're getting the highest concentration of platelets and leukocytes. Great product. This is key if you're looking to fabricate something commonly known as sticky bone. Uses in dentistry. Now, soccer preservation. Everybody here knows that regardless of what you do, the alveolus is going to change when you remove a tooth. That's inevitable. And as you can see from this slide, week one, we typically have the provisional matrix along with your blood clot. The lingual and buccal cortices are fairly intact, but as we move from week one to two to four and eight, the alveolus changes significantly, with the buccal plate being the most vulnerable. A couple of studies just demonstrating that. Chapuis in 2013 evaluated horizontal and vertical changes postoperatively week eight and found that 69% of human cases assessed at week eight presented with buccal plates less than one millimeter. And the average bone loss found during the study was roughly 5.2 millimeters. That's circumferential, vertical, as well as horizontal bone loss. Hauser, in 2013, he trefined core biopsies of sockets grafted with both PRF versus those that were not and found higher bone density and trabecular proximity when PRF was utilized. Couple of cases. First one, a 63-year-old male presents for extraction of non-restorables, teeth numbers 18 and 19. Had a non-remarkable medical history, no medications, allergic to penicillin, doesn't smoke or drink. Now, this PA doesn't really reflect the issues with number 19. It was primarily buccal cervical decay uh, along with pain. Quick look at the pre-op CBCT in which he had a pre-extraction alveolar height of almost 11 millimeters, and buccal lingual width of 9.6, almost a centimeter. 
There's a copy of the P, uh, picture of the PRF. And what I did in this case was I did a bit of a comparison, if you will. Uh, the plan all along was for me to implant number 19. Uh, the patient had no plans of implanting number 18, so uh, I grafted number 19 with 0.5 grams of allograft. I combined it with two APRF slugs, we'll call it, and I covered it with a cytoplast membrane, whereas number 18, I simply used four APRF plugs. And what I was pleased to find, this is four months post-op, the quality as well as the quantity of bone in both sockets was comparable. Now, obviously, we still have some recession, but he still has eight and a half, almost nine millimeters of bone buckled lingually, and he still has over a centimeter worth of height. He helps me to got his implant, and he's a happy camper. Case number two, 52-year-old female for treatment of a PAP number eight, past medical history of hypothyroidism, Take Xanax as needed. She's allergic to just about everything under the sun. Not remarkable social history. Quick look at the PAP, and as you can tell, she's been through the gamut. Multiple root canals, apicoectomies, recurrent pain, you name it, she's had it. So we extracted the tooth. I utilized 0.5 grams of allograft, four APRF membranes, and I used an O6 plus membrane in this case. And I just think pictures like this are pretty impressive. I, I enjoy seeing something that starts out as being particulate, mixing it with autogenous factors, and you get something that you can shape. It, it speaks to the efficacy of autogenous blood products to give us something that can hold up three-dimensionally, something that can give us good predictable osteoconduction as well as osteoinduction. So basically, I stuck this, Vienna sausage, we'll call it, into the extraction socket, and I was pleased with our end result. As you can see in the bottom slide, she has roughly eight millimeters of buccal palatal width. Some of that I know was due to the fact that this strut of alveolar bone was maintained. Anyone who does their share of soccer preservation will tell you that in order for you to do everything you can to prevent that inevitable collapse, especially in these aesthetic cases, it's important that you preserve as much of that bone as you can. Nonetheless, having that sort of result, in my opinion, is good stuff. She ultimately got a two-piece Z-Systems implant. She, too, is a happy camper. I also use this in thermal extractions. It's not difficult to sell someone, uh, be it a patient or even a parent, on the benefits of putting something into a wound to facilitate tissue repair. We all are aware of the opioid crisis in this nation, and research has shown that the use of autogenous blood products can improve or shall I say, decrease post-operative pain. And it's not difficult to sell a parent on the benefits of keeping their child out of pain. And if you can do that by taking something from them and packing it into the extraction sockets, you're doing a good service for the patient. Hoagland, Lenny Nace in 2013 studied 200 mandibular theromolar sites, treated with PRF, and found an incidence of 1% uh, dry sockets. And me, personally, I haven't seen a dry socket in three years since using PRF. And I don't know if anyone here has had a dry socket. It's terror. Okay, uh, there we go. Okay, so if you could prevent your patients from having something like that, I mean, you're doing a great thing for the patients. And uh, like I said, I haven't seen a dry socket in quite some time. Eshporn Dasmachi, they looked at 78 mandibular sockets with PRF versus those without, and also found a great reduction in the uh, occurrence of dry sockets. Uh, I'm not going to butcher that name, I'm going to say uh, Dr. B. Okay. Uh, found a reduction in pain, analgesics taken, trismus, and swelling of post-op days one, two, three, and seven. Um, pain, I find, is such a subjective symptom. I can't necessarily say I've seen a reduction in pain, but I can say, uh, anyone do thermal attractions here? Was, okay, cool. You've seen how inevitably you get this wound dehiscence. Right, and people come back, you know, I'm getting food stuck into the socket. Can you give me something to help, right? Well, what I've found since I've started using PRP is I don't see that nearly as, PRF, excuse me, I don't see that nearly as much, nearly as much. So without a doubt, something's going on uh, to keep that from happening. I mean, obviously, I'm, the more you do, the better you get, but something's changing here. I'm confident it's the PRF there. Case in point, 25-year-old female presents for extraction of painful number one in 32, not a remarkable medical history, no meds, no allergies, doesn't smoke or drink. And you can see from the 
Panorex here, nice partial bony impaction. Biologic extraction was completed. And at this period of time, I was using primarily flattened PRF uh, membranes. I have since uh, changed my approach here. Uh, I primarily pack between three to five uh, plugs, if you will, into the extraction socket, and I'll put one membrane over that socket to facilitate closure. I found that when I was simply placing the plugs, I was still getting that wound dehiscence, and I was still getting those issues of people complaining of food entrapment and the like. But once I began to utilize that membrane for closure, I didn't have that problem nearly as often. Cavitations, everybody here knows about those pesky cavitations, am I right? What's the benefit of PRF? Well, you have those leukocytes, macrophages that aid in the steriliz sterilization of the defect. You have your vascular endothelial growth factor to combat ischemia. The fibrin matrix gives you the scaffold. And the PRF interacts with the periosteum to improve postoperative healing. Case in point, 30-year-old female presents for mediation of cavitation number one. Past medical history of microscopic colitis. Does not take any medications. No known drug allergies and doesn't smoke or drink. And that's a CBCT of her cavitation with Hollinsville units reading as low as negative 300. Full thickness flap, debrided with piezo surgery, sterilized with ozone, packed with my plugs, and she's doing great. Another case, 40-year-old female presents for cavitation console status post second molar extraction as a child and a root canal on a wisdom tooth. All right? <laughs> okay. 17 has since been extracted. Not remarkable medical history. Denies it taking any medications. She's allergic to sulfa. Doesn't smoke or drink. Quick look at the Panorex. And that's her CBCT. Again, Hansville units as low as negative 59. It wasn't quite negative 1,000, but it was more than the negative 500s or so. Full thickness flap. Decorticate with piezo surgery. Sterilizes the ozone. And again, you can see that membrane that I was mentioning to you, just putting that membrane over as uh, a barrier, if you will, that's gone a long way in preventing wound dehiscence. And what I love about these PRF membranes is that they serve as just that. Um, I don't need collagenous membranes as, off, as often as I used to. You know, PRF, depending on the quality that you get, holds its own suture, hangs around for three or four weeks, is from the individual, not worried about foreign body reactions. Uh, I found when I was using PTFE membranes almost exclusively, yeah, they look good for the first couple of weeks, but right around week, day 10, let's say, they're getting all that plaque and calculus around it. They start to smell bad. I don't have that issue with PRF. It's great stuff. Now, I have to warn you, um, you're going to see some metal, <laughs> okay, in these slides. I'm starting to place more and more ceramic implants and I uh, definitely aspire to become more biologic in my practice, but uh, to date, I still do place some metallic implants, and I do the occasional apicoectomy, so just be prepared for that. I do a lot of sinus floor elevations. Uh, the benefit of the PRF is that it interacts with mesenchymal progenitor cells of the Schneiderian membrane. It can repair perforations, but there's a caveat with that. Uh, I had a number of cases in which I tried to repair fairly large perforations with PRF, and I found that while it's great stuff, it's not very adept at repairing large perforations. I think, personally, if you have a perforation over 5 millimeters, you're better off using something that is slowly resorbing, a collagenous membrane, something that will hang around for three or four months. But if you have a relatively small one, in my opinion, 5 millimeters or less, PRF works very well for that. In Gasling, in 2013, did 12 sinus augmentations with autogenous bone and bioos and closed that lateral window with PRF in some cases versus a collagen membrane in others and found that similar quality of bone was generated in both cases. Anyone here do sinus lifts? Awesome. PRF? Awesome. Good stuff. Now, there is a potential for decreasing infections in healing time, and another benefit is autogenous and bottom line, you're saving some money there. You need less product. And it's from the individual, which is great. Now, we can place simply PRF um, or use PRF simply as your, uh, your only grafting medium with, uh, with sinus lifts. However, you need to, be, to do that in conjunction with the placement of the implant. PRF, as great as it is, will not hold up uh, by itself. 
for a four, six, eight, 12 months. You need to have something that will keep that membrane tinted outwards. So if you're gonna use that as your primary medium, you need to make sure you place the implant at the same time. Case in point, 66 year old female in need of full mouth rehabilitation, not remarkable medical history, no meds, no allergies, doesn't smoke or drink. And that's her, her preoperative picture there. Obviously she needs a lot of work. So this is one case in point. If you look at the top left picture, there is a perforation there, okay? But that was a perforation I felt comfortable repairing with just PRF, it wasn't very big. And ultimately what you want postoperatively is something like this. You want to see a nice round mound of bone. You don't want to see bone all over the place. That's gonna fail. Same thing on the left side, nice round mound of bone. That's something that's gonna heal properly for the patient. Uh, now, as you can see on the bottom, we also extracted the remaining teeth and I placed six implants immediately for a fixed provisional. And she healed great. She came back post-op day four, seven, didn't swallow a lick. Now, some of that was preoperative supplementation and she was compliant. She iced and arnica gel, all that kind of good stuff too. But uh, without a doubt, the, the quality of the PRF we got from her was a benefit. Another case, 53-year-old male presents for implant in sinus augmentation number three. A past medical history of chronic sinusitis, epilepsy, asthma, and osteoarthritis. Takes Losartan, Protonix, and Primadone. Allergic to penicillin and clindamycin. Doesn't smoke or drink. That's a picture of the pre-op uh, panorex there. Sinus lift. And in this one, I did mix allograft with PRF. Um, what, and you'll see in future slides, uh, he healed very well from the picture. Uh, when you look at the healing of uh, around an implant with PRF is placed alone. Yes, you get go good bony feel. Yes, you get primary stability. Yes, you get good integration. But me personally, I like to see a nice round mound of bone surrounding an implant. I like seeing that barrier between the implant and the sinus lining. And moving forward, um, I have concerns about uh, not seeing that nice round barrier in the long-term stability of an implant. Uh, we will definitely see there is some research out there five, six years down the line, which you still have good stability and nice implants and happy patients. But me personally, I like to see a nice round mass of bone. I'll show it to me more in just a little bit. Another case, 47 year old female. Uh, she wants ceramic implant replacement of tooth number four and cavitation remediation. No medical history, no meds, no allergies, doesn't smoke or drink. Quick pre-op scan here. Again, you can see the cavitations in the area of number one, 32, 17, I mean 17 in particular, as well as number 16. And you can see the PAP at number four. Now this woman insisted upon having nothing but her own. She didn't want Mr. Ed, she didn't want John Doe, so to speak, she wanted simply uh, something from her. And she was also averse to me harvesting bone from a secondary site. So while I would have loved to have use a bone scraper and harvest bone from the ramus, for example, she has some issues with that. So we use strictly PRF. And in August of 2017, I extracted number four and remediated her cavitations at 1, 16, 17, 32. Uh, unfortunately, in February 2018, she developed a fistula, palatal to number three. She did not want root canal therapy, she wanted it out. And this is her scan in February. And as you can see, the quality of the bone in the area of number four, pretty impressive. Okay, we were able to get the implant in number four. That's a two-piece uh, Z-Systems implant. Then four months after removing number four, we inserted the implant at number three with an, a direct sinus lift, utilizing just PRF. And she healed great. She's now one year out, happy, happy, happy camper. Now, this is what I was alluding to when I mentioned that mound of bone, if you will. If you look at her scan preoperatively, she has 4.8 millimeters of alveolar height. Not bad. We then increased that to a little bit over nine with the PRF. But I like seeing that, personally. So I will continue definitely to utilize PRF as my primary um, grafting medium in the, in the with simultaneous placement, but I'm curious to see uh, long term, are there any issues with that? Is the fact that you don't have this nice barrier there, does that uh, lend itself to any issues po you know, post insertion? I've taken out a number of implants in the past that uh, were in intimate contact with the sinuses. 
Uh, they were metallic implants. Obviously, these were ceramic, so maybe that in of itself is the only difference here. But uh, it's going to be interesting moving forward to see how these implants behave five, six, ten years down the line. And I actually have post-op views of her cavitations. And again, number 17, nice bony fill, 32, same thing. 43-year-old female presents for a ceramic implant placement number three. Past medical history of hypothyroidism, no meds, allergic to penicillin, doesn't smoke or drink. And in this case, we used a flapless uh, technique. I used a transgingival punch, completed my osteotomies. You can see on the left here, the PR being asserted, being tapped vertically. Implant was inserted. And you can see the rim of the Schneiderian membrane being displaced in both the sagittal plane as well as the coronal. Grafting around implants, it could be used to, uh, you know, when implants are placed on an immediate basis, as well as to treat implantitis, indirect and direct sinus lifts, as you saw. 23-year-old female, post-orthodontic therapy as a teenager. Numbers 19 and 20 never erupted and were thus extracted. Not a remarkable medical history, but she was told by a previous surgeon that, quote, her bone was no good. Quick look at the panorex. And on her scan, she's got about a little over five millimeters of buccal lingual width here. And it's just a kind of a funky finding. This is number 20, and that's 21. I thought that was kind of funky how they split it apart like that. But what we did with her was uh, ridge splits, full thickness flap, split the bone, placed the implants, and I simply packed the voids of that split with PRF, and she did great. This is four months after the fact, and now she's gone from having an alveolar width of five millimeters to a little over eight. She's since been restored and doing well. 88-year-old female with recurrent fistulas at implant number seven. Nice bony defect here. Somehow that implant was still solid, and this woman was committed to not taking it out unless it was absolutely necessary. And one key issue, take a look at that buckle plate, how atrophic that is pre-surgically. Full thickness flap, and again, this is strictly PRF. The, B, the defect wasn't so large that I felt uh, allograft or anything rigid was warranted, so we simply packed it with PRF, and just take a look at that buckle plate now. And that's strictly with PRF. Good stuff. Bone replacement grafting. 23-year-old male for assessment of PAPs at number seven. Not remarkable med medical history, but it does smoke half a pack a day. And as you can see here, this is a little bit more than a PAP. This was actually a compound odontoma. Full thickness flap, we nucleated it. Here is your lesion with the tooth included. And because, again, the size of the defect, in my opinion, warranted the mixing of uh, cortical cancellous bone, I use xenograft in this case because obviously we're not putting implants here and mix it with PRF and it's telling me he'll great. 63-year-old male was swelling apical to number six, had root canal therapy roughly 20 years ago, intermittent pain, plus one mobility, and would like to save this tooth despite that guarded prognosis, past medical history of hypertension, high cholesterol, takes your water pill, Crestor, low presser, no allergies, non-remarkable medical history. And again, you can see the PAP above number six. And for this, we did an apicoectomy, fistula, Apical number six there, full thickness flap, bevel the root, and again, filled it with strictly PRF. Patient healed well, and this is four months post-op. Good bony fill, nothing foreign, nothing freeze-dried to mineralize, no foreign bar reactions. Patient did wonderfully. Guided tissue regeneration. A big challenge when you have someone whose jaws are so atrophic that you can't, you got to do something to give them a foundation that's implantable. Now, historically, there have been a number of techniques utilized to regenerate bone. Uh, PTFE membranes, like the case I showed you initially, titanium cribs, uh, collagen-based resorbable membranes, you name it, it's been used. Uh, a few years ago, I attended a course in Arizona in which they were using um, alloplast mixed with blood and housing it in titanium impregnated PTFE membranes. Um, in my experience, uh, the tissue didn't like 
titanium. It just doesn't like it. It tends to recede, and there are a number of occasions in which my grasp were greatly compromised because primary closure it wasn't sustainable. But in the case of PRF, not the case. PRF actually facilitates soft tissue repair. 40-year-old female, rehabilitation of her pre-maxilla. Now a remarkable medical history. No meds, no allergies, doesn't smoke or drink. And again, you can see the nature of the periodontal issue she has. Full thickness flap, biologic extractions. We utilize eight APRF membranes, four tubes of IPRF, two grams of xenograft. And I just enjoy, again, pictures like this where you have sticky bone hanging stuff upside down. And I got to enjoy what I do. <laughs> so adapted the bone. I covered with the PRF membranes. I did use um, an OSIX Plus membrane in addition to the PRF. And this is her four months out. You can see preoperatively what we're working with and now postoperatively. That, for all intents and purposes, is an allograft. Or, I'm sorry, is a, uh, is a block graft. But I didn't have to access the chin. I didn't have to access the ramus. I'd have to cut open her hips. And here we are building a nice mound of bone and look to implant her in the next few months. Another case, 81-year-old female, failing five-unit bridge from 9 to 13, past medical history of hypertension, arthritis, and anxiety, takes a few medications, some allergies there. Sweetest lady you ever want to meet, <laughs> all right? But this is her situation. And if you note, know, preoperatively, the area of number nine, it's difficult to see the numbers, but this is no more than four and a half millimeters of, of width there. I think it's almost five. And the area of number 11, she actually has a cavitation. Full thickness flap. The bone was perforated. Our sticky bone was fabricated and covered. And this is her now. Whereas pre that dimpling effect we had right here in the mid-alveolus, that's been bulked out by a couple of mil millimeters. And the nice rounded architecture of that bone, I've never seen this sort of bone development without the use of autogenous blood products. You can't get this simply by hydrating some allograft with some saliva or with some saline <laughs> and spackling it on there. You need something that helps you promote good, pa passive, predictable osteointegration. And this gives you that. She's since been implanted. These are 3.6 by 11 and 13 millimeter fixtures, and she's doing great. Now the case here, 65-year-old female, presents for extraction and implant place in number five, past medical history of borderline hypertension, takes her multivitamins, allergic to latex and iodine, smokes a little weed. And you can see here the vertical defect present. Now she was insistent upon keeping number five, despite this mobility present. Your wish is my command. Biologic extraction. And again, I love seeing that. Where else are you going to get stuff like that, right? The site was grafted and closed. This is immediate post-op, and I, I didn't expect to get all of this back, but now foremost post-op, the probing disc went from 11 to now 5. Mobility is gone. She's now implanted, happy, as a, happy camper. 39-year-old female requesting implant, retain, support, and restoration of a posterior mandible. Non-remarkable medical history, no meds, smokes about a pack a week, has since stopped. No allergies, and uh, outside of smoking, nothing crazy. Now, there's no way you can implant that, okay? Right mandible, and again, that's the left mandible. So, full thing this flaps, mix some, some, uh, some xenograft with PRF. There's that wonderful stake. Now this is pre-op and this is post-op. Now, would I have liked more bone? Absolutely. But whereas preoperatively, there's nothing you can do for this woman. Now, I can split the ridge. I can use lateral condensation. If I can talk her into getting ceramic implants, I could take advantage of her keratinized gingiva. She's got options now. Right mandible, again, the tapered uh, look of the alveolus compared to postoperatively. Now she's got options. Unfortunately, uh, we were unable to get her implants because we had to edentulate her maxilla. So unfortunately, she had to put off 
place heat gain plants. But without a doubt, that, in my opinion, is a wonderful improvement. And you don't see that without harvesting chin, without harvesting ramus, and, and fixating bone and, and things of that nature. Last case here, 61-year-old female in need of dental rehabilitation of her maxilla. Not remarkable medical history, but she is allergic to zithromycin. Drinks on occasion. That's her preoperatively. You can, you can appreciate the nubinization of the sinuses bilaterally. There's our sticky bone. Again, a person can't get enough of looking at that stuff. That, to me, is just kind of cool. <laughs> All right. And postoperatively, she's now six months out. She's ready for implantation. Now, while I would have liked a little more bone in the left maxilla, she now has room for 5.4 by 8 millimeter implant, area of number 14, and a 5.4 by 9, area of number 14, or number 3, rather. And in addition to that, we were able to do an onlay to the area of number 5. Preoperatively, she's got about 5 millimeters here. Now she's over 8. And the quality of the bone, in my opinion, is excellent. Moving forward, uh, one thing I neglected to mention, and, and anyone who's played, so to speak, with PRF will uh, undoubtedly attest to this, it is crucial that we let these APRF membranes breathe. Uh, there have been a number of times when I will open up those vials and you're looking at primarily exited. You wait 10, 15, 20 minutes or so, and next thing you know, things start to kind of congeal for you. Now you have something that you can work with. Hydration, in my opinion, has aided in the quality of, of uh, the APRF we've obtained. Now, I said I sedate uh, in the office, and obviously when people come in, they're dehydrated. And there are a number of occasions in which I have taken, say, eight vials of APRF. Uh, I'm not very pleased with the quality that they get, but then I give them 250 mLs of lactated ringers, let's say. I then do another venipuncture, and sure enough, second round is better. So hydration definitely played a role. I'm curious as to how preoperative supplementation uh, will benefit the harvesting of PRF. I have seen definite benefits uh, when I was overseas uh, observing Dr. Vols. Uh, he would give vitamin C infusions intraoperatively and would get a better quality of APRF. Um, I've seen similar results with just simply hydration. Uh, but I do recommend that my patients uh, supplement preoperatively with vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. And uh, to date, I have seen an, an improvement in the consistency in, in what I get. It's been a long time since I've seen someone with no quality APRF. Now, in my opinion, while I love APRF, um, I do think there are instances, instances in which you should mix it with something that is uh, more rigid. Uh, one example being if there's no buccal plate. Uh, me personally, I feel that if that tissue is going to collapse inward. If you don't put something of substance in there to keep it tended outward, you're uh, potentially going to compromise your end result. I tend to mix when I'm grafting the, the pre-maxilla, especially the canine eminence. That buckle plate is so thin, it's so friable, I just don't have the confidence that APRF by itself uh, will get the job done, so to speak. Obviously, if you're doing on-lay grafts, the posterior mandible in particular, uh, si extractions in the presence of large sinuses, uh, defects larger than one centimeter, in my opinion, and again, if you have poor matrices. Uh, and again, one more word about the sinus perforations. I mean, they're, they work great. They look like a membrane for all intents and purposes, but me personally, I think if you have a defect over five millimeters, you're better off using something a little more rigid. Yes, sir? Oh, four minutes, cool. None. <laughs> all right, questions? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right.